So we are now joined by Kane's f- football team, specifically head coach Dan Garrett. How are you doing, coach? I'm doing well, Doran and Jish. Thanks for having us today. We're excited to be a part of your program. Thank you. No problem, of course. And you did not come alone. You came with several of your football players. We are joined by Dante Jameson, Anthony Bassani, uh, Dante Capazzoli, Keon Taylor, Dante Jameson, and so many others. How are all of you doing? We're good. Doing great. Doing good. Glad to be here. So leading into our first question, this is for Anthony. The 2020 season was really short. Uh, there was only one game played as a whole. So what were your thoughts following that season and, you know, coming into this brand new one in the fall? So uh, obviously our thoughts were uh, excited because we had a short season for 2020 and, you know, going through everything with COVID, it was tough for any football program to go through. Um, and then leading up to the 2020 season, obviously we're excited because we only played one game and we had a lot to prove and, you know, the rest of the games got canceled. So we were just super excited for this season to show everybody, you know, who doubted us what we could do. Yeah, for sure. And you definitely did uh, show up four teams specifically exactly who you guys were this season. It was uh, awesome to watch you guys. Um, this next question is for Captain Capazzoli. Um, you were named a preseason All-American. Uh, was there any added pressure going into the season because of that? No, there wasn't any added pressure. It was always nice to see. I mean, it was it was a great honor, but I give a lot of that to my teammates. They helped me do they helped me do everything. I mean, I wouldn't be anywhere without them. So it was it was a great honor, but it was really appreciated to them. Following your 0 and 3 start to the season, I know you guys did an interview with the Tower, specifically Coach and Dante, and you mentioned some of the things that you can improve on, and obviously you did going on a three-game winning streak right after. But, you know, what was the message to the team to basically right the ship, Coach? Well, you know, the messaging is so important, especially when you start 0-3. And and the way we started 0-3, it wasn't close losses. Uh, We had a game in there that we thought we we let one slip away against Utica, but at the end result, we had two bad losses. And, you know, really it was about letting them know, you know, it's okay to feel the feelings that we felt, you know, we all felt very disappointed. We all felt frustrated. There was other terms that we can't say in your podcast. Uh, But ultimately, you know, we really talked about a lot of the messaging that we use in our program as a whole and the culture that we talk about that the ultimate measure of man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And we're only as strong as the adversity we overcome is one of our core covenants, our core value. Uh, And we talk about that constantly. We, We talk about it, off season, in season, you know, preseason, and, and obviously now we're in it. Uh, the ability for this group of young men to be able to be persistent enough not to listen to the outside voices was amazing. And it's a credit to them as a whole. And we're very young, but the leadership in this program behind the guys you're looking at, Dante Capazzoli, KT, Aaron, Nasneel, Bassani, those guys who are older, the leadership was phenomenal because, you know, they know how I feel about it. tough times don't last tough people do. And it certainly wasn't where we wanted to be, but that was the messaging. And there was nothing like adversity to refine and, and look at where we need to get better and reveal who we are as a team. And the big message ultimately was the fact that 0-3, as much as it was not where we wanted to be, uh, had no bearing on what the season meant because we didn't start an NJAC season yet. So that was the real main sounding board that the NJAC season started now. And we choose to make it what we wanted to make it. So we wanted to learn from those three losses. And, and ultimately now looking back, we had the 22nd hardest schedule in division three football because of those three games. And then there's 250 schools. So those three games prepared us for the conference and, and certainly wasn't where we wanted to be, but those guys were resilient and persevered to the point where they learned from that. They used it as a, as a springboard to learn from it against maybe listen, good teams, but not the teams that we played week one or certainly week three that ended up only losing, you know, one game apiece in the entire season. So, you know, we wanted to make sure that it was about ownership, looking themselves in the mirror as an individual, seeing what they can improve upon and making sure that they need to make the individual effort to become better first in their own world, to have an impact in our world as a program. And it was really about just getting better. And those three games prepared us for that. Uh, And we did. And the credit to them, they fought every day to make sure they got the ship right. And they ride the ship 
I'm just fortunate enough that they believed and trusted in their leader as their head coach to listen and buy in and do it. So that's really what it was. They stayed together. They stayed together. They stayed the course and they worked their, you know, what's off to prove everybody that it wasn't just going to be, you know, the same old season. And they, and they did, they righted the ship. This next question is going to be for Dante Jameson. Um, you were asked to do it all this season, asked to run the ball, to catch passes, to return kicks. You ended up being the NJAC special teams player of the year. And I don't know if you were looking at your stats, but you did finish fourth in the NJAC in receiving yards. How did you juggle all these responsibilities that were thrown at you? Just, just trusting the coach who's going to put you in the best position, you know, and having faith in the team. You know, the special teams player here, I couldn't have got that if it wasn't for the team blocking on the bump returns. Just trusting Coach G and trusting Coach Galante put me in the best position to help the team win. And, you know, speaking of stats and, you know, just leading the NJAC for Keon, Kane had an NJAC high 11 interceptions on the season, and you led the team with eight of them. What are your secrets to reading quarterbacks so well? Uh, I say that um, it's not really a secret. I've worked hard since freshman year practicing. Um, coaches, teammates give me a lot of confidence to do what I got to do. So I'm just trusting my read, trusting um, everything around me, trusting my teammates doing their job. Um, I'm not trying to do too much. I'm just doing what I'm taught, basically. So there's really no secret. It's just hard work coming in um, confidence, um, really. Before Jish goes, you know, he likes to make a lot of comparisons when we're watching basketball to uh, Darius Slay, um, you know, with the, with the amount of interceptions you had this season, I, I would say maybe a Trayvon Diggs would be. <laughs> I appreciate it. Nah, those, those guys, crazy. Darius Slay, I'm an Eagles, I'm an Eagles boy, so yeah, I like that. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm an Eagles fan. Dorian's a Cowboys fan, so we're always uh, jawing off. Like, uh, when the mic goes off, it's always – Back to that, but um, <laughs> speaking of the secondary, you guys were a phenomenal unit as a whole. Uh, Anthony, you were a senior this year. You uh, had a lot of success throughout your tenure at King, you know, rookie of the year. Uh, and there are some younger safeties on the squad. Um, you know, Tanner Ash, have you taken on sort of a mentorship role? And uh, what? who are some of the younger safeties we should look out for that might have some success in the future? Uh, yeah, definitely. I've definitely taken Tanner under my wing. Um, you know, he's considered, I think, a freshman because of COVID year. So he still has, a, I think, three more years to play. So Tanner definitely be a guy to step up and uh, take over that role. Um, you also have uh, younger safety like Lamar Winfrey and uh, Emory Mills. So we got younger guys, younger talented guys that could definitely uh, learn a thing or two and then take that to up their, uh, their game and their level of play. Is this a good time to let you know that he's coming back for his grad year, though, that he's not a senior? I think yeah, it's a good time. A great time to mention that. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, someone else on the defense that played very well, specifically in the, the homecoming game against TCNJ, was Aaron Cottrell. And, you know, you earned your first NJAC honors of the season being named to the all NJAC first team. What can you say about that honor and what it meant coming in your senior year? Uh, for me? I'm just pretty much grateful for it. Uh, all my hard work <clears throat> in the off season, working uh, working out and uh, with the coaches on uh, during uh, what's it called spring ball. <laughs> pretty much, they they pushed me. My teammates would push me. So just all came together and you know, felt good. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Now for, uh, uh, again, Dante Capazzoli, you were invited to play in the FCS National Bowl. Uh, what can you say about that honor and what that means to you? Like Aaron said, I'm super grateful to play in front of like a couple scouts, a ton of people um, to show my skills that D3 kids aren't like the bottom of the barrel that we could play. I would love to put my school on the map. So that's how I'm taking it, representing Kane down there. So it means a lot to be selected and I can't wait to show off what, what us D3 kids have. I'm sure you represent all the D3 kids well. And for coach, this was your third NJAC Coach of the Year honor, uh, adding on to the list of awards that we've already gone through for the season. What does that selection mean to you and the work that you put in this season? Yeah, this this one's a little more special than the previous two, because uh, when you're younger, you know, it's maybe more a little ego driven. But this one is special because we had 18 months of <laughs> 
I don't even know how to define it. I mean, we went through last fall where we're on a staggered schedule where we're, we're, we're dealing with half our team and we're working out twice a week with me, Coach Galanti and Coach Kreider and the other two days were Coach Graf. And it's not football season, but it's the fall, you know. So, and then spring comes and, you know, the, the one thing about the spring, which is really great, and it had a lot to do with our success is, you know, I talked to Nas Neal about it today. We only had one game, but we were on each other for 11 weeks, man. We got to practice football for 11 weeks. And I am, was so grateful for that opportunity to be around this group of guys. And it was a skeleton squad. We only had about 56 guys out there. Um, but it was still 11 weeks together where we got to be together at 530 in the morning and, you know, 16 degree weather. But it was an opportunity to, to get better at football. So this one was more special than the other two because, you know, you start to appreciate what it really means. And I'm just surrounded by great kids, man. I'm, I'm surrounded by great young men. Uh, the coaches I had, we had a lot of things behind the scenes that people don't even know about. We lost five coaches in, in late July, early August for all various reasons. So, you know, someone got a principal job, uh, someone didn't want to get vaccinated and on and on and on. So we lost five of our coaches, you know, two, three weeks before camp. And it's a skeleton squad in the coaching staff this fall. So the guys that I was surrounded by, players and coaches, this was a phenomenal team award where – coming off of 18 months of whatever the heck we went through, it just means more than ever because 0-3 could have went a lot of different ways. And to finish second in the conference where you're selected seventh, uh, this team, they fought daily to make themselves better, not just for themselves, but for the team. And they care about each other, man. There's, there's something special when you have a group of guys who truly care for one another. So this award is, is definitely more of a team thing and a program award than ever in the past just because the group of men I'm surrounded by on a daily basis, I'm grateful for. And kind of a follow-up to that. um, This team was very special this year, but you are going to have some people, of course, leaving. They've used up all their eligibility. What are some of the hot names in the underclassmen sphere that we should keep an ear out for? Uh, Well, I mean, we, we have 13 seniors coming back and obviously some of those guys are here right now. You know, Anthony Bassani is a name to keep on your radar. Aaron Cottrell, you know about, you know, you know about Nas Neal and KT, but, you know, Josh Harris, Nikki Firth is a weapon on special teams. You know, Kyle Devaney, Leo Cruz is a phenomenal senior in our program who does every, does everything the right way. And, and a guy like Jake Cirilla, I mean, there's just so many names that are just, they accept the role and they don't have to be the guy. They're just a man and they, they really love the program. And they buy into the belief that they're just here for obviously to compete, but for the program and whatever the program needs for them. So those are some of the guys who are turning our seniors, you know, and then you have drama who's coming back. who will still only be a junior on the defensive line. Um, you know, David Welch is going to be an upperclassman at the tight end position, but there's so many guys in your know, smoke, uh, you know, on the, on the offensive line, Matt Cadetti, Garrett to you know, Nick Povia. I mean, so many young kids that started Reese Powell. I mean, there's just so many names. Um, Dazzy, I knew, I mean, Dazzy's a, a freshman wide receiver. You know, so there's a lot of kids. There's 73 guys returning who've never been a part of our offseason. Like, we're going to have 90-something kids in our offseason. 73 don't even know what we're talking about. You know, so there's so many names that I can't even list them all. We're just very talented. But more importantly, I just want everyone to know, we have a great bunch of kids. Like, they're great young men. And they are they are so about selflessness. And to be a part of a program – where you have people who actually care for one another, that your best players are your best people, you have something special going on here. So this team could be really special for the next two, three years because the people who are in it. And I'm excited about all those names and even more about some of the names I didn't even mention. We have a very talented group of kids, young men coming back for the future right now. I'm sure. And I'm looking forward to watching them continue to just work and grow as a unit. And you mentioned, you mentioned a name in there and I want to, ask him a question specifically because I remember the one day we were you know going through our roster before the game and we were like wait a minute they 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 added something in here and the name was Smoke and so for Dante how did you get that nickname? I got the nickname for being fast and being hard to catch. I, I believe it for everyone who who knows Jish and I are in the are in the uh, broadcaster's booth and specifically for TCN, for the homecoming game, I'm going to um, go to that a lot. But specifically for the homecoming game, we saw the first kickoff return or punt return. And we were like, OK, like there's no way they're going to kick it back to him. 
And like imagine if it happens again. <laughs> literally. And so we're we're sitting in the booth and they're in the second quarter. They're about to punt it off again. And we're like, all right, there's no way they're going to kick it to them. And they do. <laughs> and Jish and I are absolutely going crazy in the booth. We're like, oh, no, he's he's at the third. And, you know, like typical like football announcer things, right? He's at the 30, 20. And we're like, oh, my gosh, like, why would you kick it back to him? And so we want to know, what did you see on both of those pump returns? On the first one, when I caught it, I just saw all green to the, if I reverse field, it was nothing but green. And I had some key blocks from Vaughn, Bucks on the first one. On the second one, I just saw the little alley and Vaughn led me through the end zone. I mean, we were out of our seats. That was absolutely electric. And especially, it couldn't have come on a better time than on a, the homecoming game. Uh, my next question is for uh, Nas Neal. We have 12 Cougars who rank, or excuse me, five Cougars who ranked inside the top 12 for tackles this year. And you were number 12 uh, as a corner, uh, you know, only at six foot 180. What's your mentality as a corner to go up and make these plays? We've seen you make plays on receivers, running backs in the backfield. You've been, you were all over the field this year. Going into tackles, I just think about what the coaches tell us, trapped in their head, knowing who's around me, if I got to vice it. If I got help outside, attack the inside hit. So, and using the sideline as my friend. So, and I know since Pop Warner, they've been telling me you can't, people can't run without their legs. So, I take them up. Keeping on the topic of secondary for Keon, you finally broke through and made the all NJAC first team after being an uh, honorable mention in 2019. You know, what were some of the keys? I know you mentioned some of them earlier but what were some of the keys to your success this season that you built upon after the 2019 season? Uh, well, after the 2019 season, we had that um, spring um, spring game. Um, obviously, I didn't play the best spring game. So I, after that day, I just literally I was to myself. I was working OD hard. And also, I, I looked up to um, a couple of these guys at um, DBs, like Anthony Sani, Nas, CD working hard. So they just, like I said, if I get the confidence from them, um, it's just a whole nother motor. Like you know, when you play with confidence, it just turns you something else. Just trust me, um, technique that I learned from coaches. Um, I got a great DB coach that um, taught us really good stuff. Um, Crider putting us in the best position. Coach G putting us in the best position. So I, I'm, like I said, I really did me, I was just put in the best position. So they knew I could make those plays and I did. So being a first team, um, it feels good to get the recognition, but I would like to myself to like humble myself. I always feel like I, I could be better, always be better than what I really am. Yeah, certainly. And we're, we're winding down uh, these questions now. Thank you guys again for coming and giving us your time. Um, you, Cottrell, uh, how did it feel to finally have fans back in the stands cheering you guys on this season? Uh, for me, personally, it was, uh, it like adds to our energy during the game. So it's pretty cool to have the fans back and, I know during the spring season there was there was no fans, so it was kind of dead during the games. But it just adds us it adds to our motivation. But uh, also for my 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 family comes to live in the game, so I'm grateful for them to come watch my watch my game. And you know, I want to ask the same question to Coach too. What was it like having fans back in the stands for every game this season? Yeah, you know, similar to what I said to the tower when they interviewed me. I I think that. For me, the bigger picture was a sense of returning back to normal. You know, there were so many guidelines and restrictions and, and things we had to adhere to throughout the shutdown and the closure. You know, we had to do so many things, you know, whether it was testing weekly or, or temperature scans or whatever we had to do, right? The, the daily campus check-in. So to be able to come back and, and even be together as a team and have a locker room and meet in the meeting rooms and we had to wear a mask, but, it, you know, we were back together. So the whole element of being able to have fans back in the stands, like these guys said, it's it's to be able to have not only the students and the student body and, and the administrators come support us, but our families. I mean, you know, my mom, dad, my wife, my kids, you know, these guys, parents, their loved ones, their girlfriends, to be able to have them all back there, you know, it does provide extra motivation because they're there to support you. So when things aren't going well, you know, you have people, not just your brothers on the football field, but you got your, your the ones who love you the most in the stands there to support you regardless of the outcome to be there to be in person is definitely different, you know, than, than not being allowed and not, you know, having to be behind a computer screen. So I think it was awesome to be able to have that support back and for our community here on campus and more for our players. It, it was just great having the stands full.
It was awesome. All right. And I got one more question uh, for new students like me here. Uh, we saw a tradition uh, in the pregame huddles. Somebody was holding a hammer every single time. I got to know what that's all about. So I'll give my dissertation uh, and I'll let those guys come in next. So look, man, we, we have a worker's mentality. Like at the, the end of the day, we talk a lot about hard work doesn't guarantee you success, uh, but not working hard guarantees you failure. So the hammer for us you know, we talk, there's a couple analogies, but it's a workman's, it's a workman's like attitude. And, you know, in football specifically, it's, it's really all right. There's one of two things, right? In football, you're either the hammer or you're the nail and we don't want to be the nail. So we want to be the ones dropping a hammer because the one, if you're the nail, it doesn't turn out well for you. So, so it's more of a mindset. It's more of a, a fixture of, Hey man, this is what we are. This is what we're about. We're going to go to work, but we're working hard for, we only had nine games this year. So we worked hard for, you know, probably close to 340 something days. So in our sport, we play one game a week and we only get a certain number and it's not a big number. So we're preparing almost 85 to 90 percent of our year, our calendar year in the weight room on the field in practice. So we want to make sure that workmen's like attitude. We know that hard work doesn't guarantee us a win, but not working hard every day is going to guarantee you getting your butt whipped and becoming that nail. So that's kind of my take. If anyone wants to add to it, go for it. I, I, I'll, I'll add to it. To me. It's like as a competitor, as a student athlete here, like who doesn't want to have that hammer coming out, leading away? So you feel me? We're fighting for that. So that just gives us another rush. Who's going to have the biggest hit in, um, in the games? Who's going to have the biggest play? So to me, like who wouldn't want that hammer? Who wouldn't want that hammer? That just gives another adrenaline rush to people on the field, to me. Love that answer. And for Matthew, you know, what, what was it like fighting through some of the adversity throughout the season? Um, pretty much you just do it. Our, we're coached. Uh, we had a young group, all freshmen on the field. Um, just the, some guys stepping up, being leaders, and still we're coached every week. That's it. 